Core Practical 13 is another one of these slightly odd ones, in that there isn't an investigation as such. You're not changing something and measuring and plotting a graph. You're just making measurements to try and determine the specific heat of a phase change. And the phase change here is you're trying to get the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. So it's a little bit of an odd setup. You take some chipped ice. Now it needs to be chipped small enough that it's going to melt fairly readily and consistently, but large enough so that it doesn't fall through your funnel into the beaker. And what you do is you put your chipped ice with a thermometer into a funnel like this, and you allow it to come up to zero degrees. So you keep an eye on the thermometer. The ice should be around about zero once it starts to melt and you start to see water dripping down from the funnel into the beaker. Meantime, you're preparing another beaker, a lagged beaker like this, and you measure its mass. M0 is what we're calling that. At Excel suggests you make a risk assessment for this. In handling ice straight out of the freezer, you could get freezer burns from this. Obviously, you've got water, so you need to be careful about spillages and mopping them up in case somebody slips. But really, again, like I've said before, in an experiment like this, you are kind of scrabbling around trying to find a hazard that you could use for a risk assessment. What are we going to do this with this? You take the ice, about 50 grams of it, you don't have to be too fussy about that, let it warm up to zero degrees, like I said, and catching the melt melted ice in a container, a beaker. This is your MO that you've measured here of an MTM dry beaker with the lagging around it. We're going to use grams throughout here because it's just easier um, and we'll end up with a value in joules per gram that we can just compare to the standard value. About 100 centimeters cubed of water in the beaker and then you find the mass of the beaker again, and that's our M1. So all of this is going to become, make more sense as we go through the practical. We should have two values now, one for MO and one for M1. You then measure the temperature of the water and call that theta one. So this is the water that you've just put inside the beaker. What you then have to do is take about 20 grams of your melting ice from the funnel and put it into the beaker. You try and get as close to 20 grams as you can. What they really want you to do here is not have very much, because the more ice you have, then the more heat is going to move in from the room, as opposed to the ice taking heat from the water to melt. So you put your 20 gram of ice into the beaker and you stir it until the ice is gone, and then you find your theta 2, which is the temperature reached by the ice water mixture. And so you should see that the temperature on your thermometer that you've moved from your funnel now into your beaker of water, that the temperature on your thermometer goes down and reaches the, its lowest value when all the ice has melted. And then finally you want our new mass. So we have three masses. Empty beaker, beaker plus water, and beaker plus water plus ice. And then two temperatures, original temperature of the water and temperature of the water after you've added the ice and it's melted. We also know, of course, that the original temperature of the ice was zero degrees, or at least that's an assumption we're making. We try and get it as close as possible. That's pretty much it for the experiment. So what you have to start doing now is processing your data. So what we're going to do first of all is find what the mass of the water is, and you do that by taking M1 minus M0. M1 was the mass of the beaker plus water, M0 was the mass of the beaker by itself. We also want the mass of the ice that we put into the water, the actual mass. We said it was going to be approximately 20 grams. You need to know exactly how much. So you take M2, which was mass of beaker plus water plus ice, and you subtract mass of beaker plus water from that so that you get the exact amount of ice that you've put in. There are some other things that we need to know. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram. We also know that the temperature of the ice was zero degrees to start with. And so the change in temperature of the water then is going to be your original temperature of the water that we called theta one minus the second temperature of the water after the ice had melted in it. And the change in temperature of the ice then is going to be our theta two, the temperature at the end, minus zero. And the whole principle of this is that the energy that is lost by the water is the same as the energy is gained by the ice. So the ice takes energy from the water in order to melt. And what we're trying to figure out is how much energy did the ice take from the water 
to melt itself, and that will give us the latent heat, provided, of course, there wasn't any heating of ice beforehand, and that's why we had the ice at zero, and provided that the ice, iced water, the melted ice, hasn't heated up after. So in order to do this, we're going to look at this equation here, mc delta t, the equation for specific heat capacity. So this is going to give us how much energy the water has, and of course, the mass of the water, the specific heat capacity of the water, and the temperature difference, the temperature loss of the water. And that's going to be equal to the total energy gained by the ice. So that is m times L, the mass of the ice times its latent heat of fusion, plus the mass of the ice times the specific heat capacity of water, because it will have turned into water at this point, multiplied by the change in temperature of the ice after it has melted. So that we have included that expression there so that we can add in that amount of energy. Let's now look at some data. I've made a list of all our variables here. So suppose our theta 1, the temperature of the water originally was 22, and theta 2, the final temperature of the water plus melted ice mixture is 6. These are our masses, empty beaker, beaker plus water, and beaker plus water plus melted ice. And therefore, doing calculations from those gives you the mass of the water and the mass of the ice. And all I've done then is I've just substituted the, these in here. So mass of water left everything in grams because I've got my specific heat capacity in grams. Change in temperature, again, is just the subtraction of those two there. Substitute it in, rearrange, and find a value for L. So my value for L that I got was 285.9 joules per gram. The accepted value is 336. So not bad. Exactly how bad we can find out by calculating the percentage error. So the difference between my value and the accepted values, you just subtract those. Over the accepted value, if we know an accepted value, that always goes on the bottom of that equation, times 100 gives me a percentage error of 14.9%. Now, that might seem like a lot, but we have made a lot of assumptions over the course of this experiment, and I will come back and look at those in a moment. One thing at Excel is it pains to point out during this is the uncertainty in the thermometer reading. Now, this depends on the resolution. Because we haven't got any repeats, we obviously can't do half the range of the repeats. We are depending on the resolution of the instrument to give us our uncertainty. And in that situation, we go plus or minus half the resolution. So therefore, for every reading we take of temperature, we have a 0.5 degree uncertainty in our temperature reading. But because we take two readings, Ed Excel describes it as because you're subtracting them, it increases the uncertainty. But you can think about it if you take two readings, the initial temperature and the final temperature, you have 0 0.5 degrees per reading, which means that you have twice that uncertainty in the change in temperature. So our uncertainty in our change in temperature will be one degree here. And let's look at what effect that has. The first change in temperature was 16 degrees. That was how much the original water fell. And so if we put one degree over 16 times 100, we end up with a percentage uncertainty of 6.25%. Second, change in temperature we had was 6 degrees. That was from the ice heating up from 0 to 6. That gives us a much bigger percentage uncertainty. Because we were multiplying these quantities in our equation, we would end up with a very large uncertainty in our temperature reading. So it is the largest source of uncertainty here, but not necessarily the largest source of error. And this is a problem with the difference between uncertainty and error. The uncertainty you have to take from your readings or your repeat readings, but of course that doesn't necessarily mean that those readings are inherently correct, or even within that range of uncertainty, because you could have a massive systematic error. So you think, because your uncertainty is small, that the answer must lie in there, but actually you've got an error. Here we have quite a few assumptions that we're making, so we'll have a look back up at our method and see, can we identify where those assumptions are? Let's have a look here and see if we can spot any uncertainties. We've measured a lot of masses here, but presuming that we have a decent uh, top pan balance that measures to 0.1 of a gram, and that we have zeroed the top pan balance before we started, measuring the mass here isn't likely to be a significant source of error. However, I said zero degrees into the beaker, because we were supposed to allow the ice to warm up to zero degrees. Now, in theory, 
the ice will melt at zero degrees. What you actually find when you're doing this experiment is that the ice is not going to start at zero degrees. And plus, the ice is not dry. So you're going to have some melted water already around the ice. That means that some of the energy will be put into heating that water and that will, that will comprise some of the mass of the ice and so you're introducing error into your equation right here. Assuming that all of the 20 grams that you put into the beaker is ice at zero is quite a big assumption. Our other pretty big assumption here is that the only energy that's gained by the ice is that that it's lost by the water. And of course, while we've lagged our beaker and we're doing our best to try and prevent environmental heat from coming in, that is impossible to prevent entirely. So you are going to get some heat coming in from the surroundings and so the energy gained by the ice will be more than that actually lost by the water. This means of course that our left, the left hand side of our expression would be smaller than it should be leading us to a smaller value of L which is indeed exactly what we got. So the difference between our L and the accepted value could be accounted for by some energy coming in from the environment in order to melt the ice 